Why is data storytelling a critical skill in the enterprise? How can organizations deliver impactful data storytelling skills across workforces? And how can organizations identify a lack of data storytelling capabilities? And what's the cost of ignoring it? In this episode of Data Humanized, we'll answer these questions with David Kiomo, Data Visualization Principal at Humana. Please enjoy my conversation with David. Welcome to Data Humanized, presented by Correlation One. In each episode, we bring you the unique perspective of enterprise leaders at the intersection of technology and humanity who are leading cultural transformation through the power of data. You'll also hear the real life stories of learners who have graduated from the Data Skills for All program and who are embarking on new career pathways, creating a more inclusive, collaborative, and effective workforce. I'm your host, Mark Palmer. Please visit the Correlation One website for more about how data literacy transforms enterprises and tell your friends about the Data Humanized podcast. Back in May of this year, Gartner identified the top 10 data and analytics trends of 2023. They combined three key principles, thinking like a business, ecosystems and platform, and most importantly, don't forget the humans. But what are the critical skills that workers need so enterprises can fulfill this complete vision? The answer, of course, is data literacy. And when it comes to making impactful decisions, data storytelling. Gartner agrees. They say organizations' data literacy programs need to emphasize combining data and analytics and human decision-making. They also predict that the most widespread way to consume analytics by 2025 will be data storytelling. But the current state of data storytelling and literacy is grim. Just 25% of workers feel prepared in those areas. So how can executives increase storytelling capabilities to enable better decision-making? Today, I'm speaking with David Kiomo, Data Visualization Principal at Humana. We'll learn actionable steps to improve communication and collaboration around data and hear real-world examples of business impact from data storytelling. Hi, David. One of my favorite things about you is your passion for data and storytelling. Talk about your formative years and where you caught that bug. Well, it didn't start with data or storytelling for that matter. It started with the fact that at 12 years old, I wanted to be a cartoonist. And that led me to go to art school for illustration, which uh, the intent there was to be a Disney animator. Um, after four years of classes and a lot of hard work, I realized that Disney animation was not my calling after all. Um, but that led me down a path to go work for the Discovery Channel in the creative services department, which I was surrounded by graphic designers and started to really learn the craft of in the, in, in the art of graphic design. Um, as an illustrator, I was completely out of my wheelhouse though. And so over the next decade of my career, morphing to be a graphic designer or into a graphic designer, what I realized is, uh, I've, I worked, I retain the passion for communicating things visually. So that storytelling aspect was always there. It just wasn't as prevalent or on the surface as it is now. The data passion really came in the last 10 years that I've been working for Humana. I didn't, I, I never had an expectation of working within the world of data and analytics. Um, I was asked to fill a role as a storyteller, a visual storyteller in the world of data and analytics. It wasn't until about two years after starting the journey at Humana that I realized that there was a natural crossover um, that I could apply these skills as a, a storyteller within the data world. And unbeknownst to me, data storytelling was already a topic or category. I just had to find it. So it, it was a weird journey from traditional illustration to graphic design to data and analytics. Um, but the one thing that I've always kept was that innate ability, that trained skill to be able to communicate visually. I love that you have a background in animation, graphic arts, and storytelling. Are there times when you explicitly call on that background when you're working with data? Every, every project, every day, every time I sit down, um, I'm recalling all of the trained skills from art school 
and my career, uh, whether it be around color, color theory, color practice, which is a tremendous asset within data visualization and data storytelling, um, design, layout, uh, understanding the, the neuroscience and the cognitive processing of the human mind when it comes to visual communication. What do we see first? What do we see second and third? How to maybe draw attention to something in particular uh, that you want to uh, really focus on, maybe in a dashboard or report. Um, I heavily rely on the narrative storytelling aspect of things. How do you create an interesting story and then illustrate it? Surprisingly, um, I, I apply everything that I learned. I actually apply more things that I learned now than I did as an illustrator, to be honest with you. Or at least I connect the dots more now, which probably tells me I was destined for this career. <laughs> Some people might know the name Humana, but not know much about it. Generative AI says that your mission is Humana, empowering people to have healthier lives through innovative healthcare solutions and services. That seems pretty good. And it's number 42 in the S&P 500. What's motivating for you and inspiring about their mission? Once I got hired and then really understood what the mission of the company was, I became incredibly uh, dedicated and passionate to it. It is about helping our members and, and non-members for that matter, um, lead healthier lives. Um, and it isn't just about the insurance aspect. We are migrating away from a, a, the heavily insurance model to more of a well-being model. And it, and it really is about helping others. And I think that combination of doing what I enjoy doing for a career, and I have that added benefit of contributing to helping millions of people um, even if it's on a back end, even if it's helping our decision makers and our senior leaders make better decisions in order to help those members, um, really, really resonates with me. My previous job at the World Wildlife Fund had a similar feel to it. I was really contributing to the conservation of natural places and people around the world. And here it's, it's really about this kind of boots on the ground, real touch human aspect to a job. And it's it's a wonderful thing to see these testimonials and members speak out to see how Humana has helped them in their journey and to know that you have that really, really, really small part of it. That's really cool because you have a job whose external mission is to help people and your internal mission is to empower the Humana team as well. I honestly thought that it was going to be more established than it was, to be honest. Um, when I came in 10 years ago, it was very uncommon for somebody who, especially with my background, to be in IT. Um, I was surrounded by developers, programmers, engineers, architects, uh, BI professionals, et cetera, uh, data people, data scientists, right? And that's a good segue to your role leading the center of excellence at Humana. Can you talk about your role there and how you engage with stakeholders? So it took a while to get my feet wet and to get people to trust what I do. I think a lot of folks saw it as a nice to have as far as prettying up dashboards is kind of how it was looked at. <laughs> After a while, we established a flow in the center of excellence that I now lead, which is called the Data Viz Hub. Uh, the Viz stands for Visualization, Innovation, and Storytelling. It really is an enterprise-wide resource. And, and it does a number of things. It provides best practices, style guides. It provides education and learning opportunities, generalized information, um, assessments, and, and, and things like that. So it, it really becomes the one-stop shop, more around data literacy than just around data storytelling. If anything, it's, it started as how do you become a better data visualization person? Then we kind of expanded it to why do we visualize things? It's to tell stories. And why do we tell stories? It's really to improve people's data literacy when it comes to consuming information. So, you know, it, as it evolved, it became bigger and bigger. It, to this day, is the only thing within our company that exists on this level for the data practitioners whether that be the back end data or the front end data people. And I'm to this day still the only data visualization principal at Humana, which is kind of, again, interesting to me out of, you know, 68, 70,000 people. 
we have yet committed to memorializing this work to be a bigger thing. It is incredibly heavily focused on. There are a lot of folks that understand the value and the importance of it. And we certainly have a lot of that support. But in the grand scheme of things, it's still really in its infancy. What's your personal take on data storytelling as a discipline? And what drives your interest and motivates you as an advocate for it at Humana and beyond? I think for a lot of folks, it's still a buzzword, to be honest. It hasn't been around that long as a formalized industry enough to really take a hold in every organization or every department. When you look at Gartner, Forrest, or McKinsey, and a lot of these big agencies, they'll, they preach it, they talk about it, they write blogs about it, they write books about it. There's you know, probably 28, 30 more books now than there were 10 years ago on data storytelling specifically, never mind data literacy as a new thing. Uh, but it is here to stay, and it is a very real thing. Uh, so it's it's more about finding the ways to bring that discipline from a, a misunderstood perspective to an understood perspective. And the way that we really are doing that here is on a case-by-case -case basis. We're kind of proving out through use cases the success that you can have when you merge um, back-end data, data science, governance, et cetera, um, engineering, so the best BI practices, that includes technology. The work that I do, which is really helping that storytelling later uh, to some degree, a design thinking layer. When you bring all of that together and you have the right business partner, you know, the right project, it can be a game changer for, for, for a company. It can turn into an ROI or it can turn into just hey, you know, we really needed that to be able to make better decisions. So it's it's been kind of interesting watching both the industry grow and watching us grow within, with inside of our own walls, trying to be that voice, trying to be that advocate for the best practices or a better process of how we do this, which requires a lot of education. Um, that's why I do a lot of tutorials and a lot of classes within our walls to get people upskilled or reskilled. That's why I'm constantly reminding people that this is part of a data literacy conversation. So how do we get one of those types of programs instituted? But again, I can't stress this enough. To some degree, even though it's far less than it was in the beginning, I still get those people that come to me every now and then and says, I just, I just need to understand how to pick better colors. I just need to pretty up my charts. So as I find those opportunities to re-educate folks, it's it's really been a, a wonderful experience because I'm engaging with everybody from across the enterprise, from our CEO all the way down. And I'm starting to find patterns of where the challenges are. Um, and it's in no one particular group. It's in no one particular part of the enterprise. It's, it's just, I think, uh, forever and eternity, we saw BI in particular uh, and dashboarding and reporting a certain way. And that certain way is with blinders on. Um, it's get data, drop it into a tool, pick some visuals and call it a dashboard or a report. Um, so part of it for me has been showing folks, as I mentioned before, when you do this process correctly, look at the big night and day difference, the before and after difference of what you probably would have ended up with, with what you can have. Uh, the biggest aha moment for me was defining the needs versus the wants. I can't tell you how many times somebody would come to me saying, we want to see, or I would like to see X, Y, and Z. Once I got them focused on what they actually needed to see through an investigation type of exploratory question and answer period, uh, that, that design-led thinking session, it really started to tease out what the most critical insights were that they were chasing. And what I've noticed is we've gone from these 15 tab you know, 85 metric type of reports or dashboards down to almost single screen 
or very interactive, clickable, more intuitive, exploratory products. Um, just by asking that one simple question, what do you actually need? I love that advice. Your first general rule of thumb with working with data is to slow down, to actually get rid of the data and focus on what you're trying to say. Well, it depends on who's coming to me. If the business partner, if the person who needs the product is coming to me, then it's a different conversation. If the development team or the IT team that was asked to deliver the product comes to me, the conversation starts differently. I always like to be involved at all possible at the very beginning of the conversation, that's critical. I don't like coming into these projects and trying to clean something up. When I sit down, um, I recognize the hesitancy and the fear to some degree of an individual experiencing a process, a new process for the very first time. So I don't try to overwhelm them with terminology or whiteboards or sticky notes, you know, that typical design led thinking type process. I try to mask it as just, hey, let's have a conversation. Their, their guard in the defenses kind of come down a little bit. Once those walls are down, they're a lot more open uh, to answering the questions I have. Sometimes I start at the very beginning. The one thing I do not do is I do not ask them about the data. I love that you're out to break the, get the data loaded into Tableau, build a dashboard cycle, that data first mentality. It's not my wheelhouse. I don't, I wouldn't even know what they were talking about even if I did ask them about the data. I'm leaving that up to the IT team that's in the room to have a parallel conversation at, enough, at another time about the data. I'm asking them, okay, I assume you have the data. I'm assuming that you have an idea of what you need to be communicating. Let's tease that out. And so I keep them laser focused on the story. When they start to go down the rabbit holes of discussing the data and why the data supports the story, I just kind of politely shut them down and just explain that that's not what we're doing right now. But everybody's anxious to get the product. Everybody's like, why can't we just get it in and start playing around with it? Why can't we just uh, visualize it and figure out while we're doing that what it says? I slow them down to a point where, where the thinking can be more clear about why are we doing this? We have over 42-ish thousand dashboards and digital reports in our BI environment today across multiple platforms. Why? Even at a company our size, we don't need that many things communicating information. So part of this is for me to help cure some of that problem or correct that problem. Maybe we need fewer things, but better things. And the only way that we or get there is to really think about what are we doing and why are we doing it? What purpose does this serve Humana? Individual leaders will come to me and say, I need a dashboard. But Ultimately, it's like, well, what is that dashboard, maybe for your purpose only, going to do to serve Humana? Everything we do is supposed to be serving the greater good. What Help me understand that part of it, too. A lot of times, what ends up coming of these conversations is, well, you know what? We actually don't need a, a dashboard. All we needed was a back-end report. Or uh, sometimes it's, oh, I had no idea that there was already a dashboard or report out there that does the same thing, maybe we'll go talk to those business partners and partner with them on that product and get our data in their tool. Sometimes the conversation goes, well, you know what? I actually don't need it. I don't need that at all. I thought I did, but now that you talk about it this way, I, you know, let, let's backtrack and figure out what other type of tool do I need? But I do try to get people to slow down and think. Can you talk about a specific business challenge you may have faced that was solved by improving data storytelling skills? I, you know, obviously I can't go into too much detail, but uh, just for privacy purposes, but um, it was actually one of the most recent projects that I worked on. So the corporate strategy team that reports directly to our senior leadership came to, to the development team and said, we need a dashboard that's going to go to the board of directors. Very high level, high profile project. Um, and it was a financial dashboard. Went in head first. We, we took that dive and that leap of faith, assuming that they knew what they needed. And we discovered that it isn't just about financial metrics. It's about a, a snapshot in time of the enterprise. 
discovering who the audience was, was a critical factor in this because the board of directors does not have a lot of time to consume this information. So we needed to find ways to communicate it quickly and intuitively. We knew that they weren't going to be clicking inside of the Power BI dashboard. They were going to be consuming it statically. So that was a huge factor. Once we kind of listed out all of the variables of the audience and how they were going to consume it and what they were actually trying to tease out, we were able to push through this process of what is the thing that we're going to deliver. But then because of the, the folks on that team, on the strategy team that came with the initial ask, also sat on other projects that were going to the board. And of course, they loved what we were doing. And they said, well, we've got this other dashboard that's going to the board of directors too. And maybe you can jump on that call and try to figure out and help us figure out what that thing is. And there was another one that came up about clinical metrics. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why are we developing all of these and building all of these independent individual products that are going to the same audience? If this was you and you were given multiple things to log into, isn't that an annoying experience? So then I start thinking back to my UI UX days and thinking, what can we do to build this experience, this place, this centralization of this content so that one person can come into one place, but be able to consume all of this information very um, strategically and, you know, kind of very in a very organized fashion. Well, that was like, a light bulb went off in their mind. To me, that was like, well, that, that's a given. To them, they, they hadn't thought about that before because they had blinders on. They, they were thinking in silos of these individual products categorized by the type of data that they wanted to tell stories around. So, but the interesting thing that ended up happening was that the associate incentive plan folks said, you know what, actually, now that we see this other thing that you're doing, we don't need one at all. We'll just wrap up our additional 10 metrics into that bigger dashboard because you're, you're already covering the other five or seven of them, which they had no idea that these metrics were repetitive. So it was kind of like, again, it was just syncing everybody up. We ended up designing one dashboard instead of three, which was phenomenal from a resource perspective. We got the project delivered a lot faster overall. Um, everybody on the business side of the house, the strategy team, the AIP folks, which were HR and the clinical quality folks were all very happy because they got something fast. From what I hear, the audience was very happy with the product because everything was consistently presented. The stories were very clear, very intuitive, uh, which in the past, it would have taken a 75 page PowerPoint deck to, to do what one or two pages did in this product. And so, you know, it, it just goes to show you that with that little extra time, although I was being very pressured and very rushed to deliver very quickly, um, it was just that, just give me an hour, just give me an hour to ask some questions and let me tease this out a little bit for you. And all of a sudden the deadline of tomorrow said, oh, well, actually we can give you till Friday now because I like where you're going with this. The urgency wasn't really urgent. The urgency was around, we don't really know what we're doing. And so rather than show nothing, let's show something, even if that something is wrong. Now, there's some truth to that. I do believe that you can work quickly and explore and develop, and it's okay to make mistakes and, and you know, just progress, right? Showing progress is good. But when it comes to data, when it comes to storytelling around data, when it comes to interpreting or analyzing data, when it comes to finding those opportunities within data, I, I always am a little skeptical of the fast delivery model. Because once we consume something a certain way and we get used to consuming it that way, we, we lock in unconsciously or subconsciously. So if I see a certain set of data and it's represented visually a certain way and I get used to that visualization, if you then switch it up to on me later, I, it takes me a little bit longer to relearn how to consume that information, right? So it's, it's confusing. And this is all happening on a very unconscious cognitive level, uh, which I think a lot of folks delivering these products traditionally don't think about.
You know, this reminds me of a study done in France that extols the virtues of pen and paper and sketching solutions. And they found that ideation with paper and pen is four times more effective than using digital mediums. If we start by listening and sketching, we'll find better insights. To this day, I, I tap into my illustration days to this day. And when I ask somebody what they're looking for, I take a ton of notes. And then I will, before I start the design process, the visual process of what is this page going to look like? How do you navigate it? You know, what kind of charts am I going to use around these types of stories and insights? I actually bullet list out an outline of my own goals of what I'm trying to achieve to keep me on track. Um, it's about thinking through it so that I don't find myself similar to the PowerPoint example where people will just sit down and they'll just start dumping things onto a page and they kind of try to figure it out as they go. But that's how you end up with these extensively long PowerPoint uh, presentations that really go nowhere. It's just a bunch of slides. And so by thinking about what, what do I really want to say first, the how am I going to say it almost happens naturally. I'm thinking about a trend over time story. Great. Well, there are only a certain amount of visuals that tell trend stories. But if I don't start with identifying that it's a trend story to begin with, then I'm going to be dumping data in and picking all these different types of visuals, looking for the one that is the coolest. And that, 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 that's something that I, I constantly coach people on. So to part of your question, I have to, I, I'm very transparent about my process with people. I, I give it away. And the reason why I give it away is because I strongly believe, and I learn better this way myself, if you understand kind of how the process goes, then you, you have a certain expectation of the outcome. If you don't, you could get anything, right, as a result. And I like to guide people through what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. For somebody who isn't used to that process, they almost get this free ride when they're on these projects because they get to learn how to do it themselves. And if they want to go off and try to practice it and create their own dashboards, great. So you share your thought patterns with them by sharing artifacts, sketches, and your list, right? I have at least six or seven versions of every, like if I'm just doing, let's say a one page dashboard, which rarely happens, but I'll have six or seven versions on a, on a piece of paper that Get, like, and, and again, that's an illustrative thing. Like as an illustrator, that's what you do. You think about composition, layout, you think about subject matter, you think about story. Those sketches develop, you know, each sketch is 15 to 20 seconds. And it's just blocking in the concept and the idea to say what really stands out the most. Um, all of them could be viable solutions. Creativity, art in particular is subjective. Everybody's going to like something different for the most part. But when you apply, uh, when you remove cognitive biases and you apply best practices around design and you look at things like the Gestalt principles of visual perception, et cetera, et cetera, you, what you find is all of these could be really great, but this one really stands out. And I'm not designing down to the detail. What I'm doing is just trying to get a big sense of how do I want to approach it. It's very similar to before an architect develops a detailed blueprint, they're, they're sketching it out. They're trying to get a base idea of the direction they want to go in. For the data folks, for people who are heavily left-brained, analytical, data scientists, et cetera, they don't think that way intuitively. They can, it's just not a practice skill set. And so I'm asking people to use some of the right side of their brain more in this process than they may be used to. But it's, it's an interesting phenomenon when you get these people, engineers, developers, architects, using that side of their brain. They really enjoy the idea of thinking through in a different manner or in a different way um, they feel more confident in their decisions as well. Storytelling is sort of a soft skill. Many executives don't see why it's something to invest in. One way to educate people is to explain what happens when you don't have good storytelling skills. Have you seen that kind of challenge in your time at Humana? I'll tell you, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon because they're the ones asking for it 
yet they're one of the audiences that are the most resistant to change. I have the luxury of working for a senior leadership team, a C-suite team that really understands the value and the impact. They see my products directly and they 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 saw those same products before the redesigns or before the creation, right? So there's a lot of uh, buy-in. That doesn't mean though that we have a corporate wide data literacy program or data storytelling program. For the reluctant leaders, the convincing, to me, it's usually proof in the pudding. Sometimes you have to design something whether you were asked to or not, just to show the impact it could have. That doesn't necessarily get you the buy-in. The mindset shift that you're talking about is critical. And that's really what we're talking about. It isn't just about skills, it's about mindset. Five years from now, the mindset's gonna be so standardized that it's gonna be a no-brainer. But since the topics are still relatively new, and a lot of people are just finding ways to implement this stuff, um, on a on a larger scale than one-off individuals, it it's about understanding and commitment and investment in individuals. You may or may not see a big ROI. You may or may not see a shift in your ability to make decisions. But it's the ability to train up or skill up the individual workers. Um, because if they don't get it with you, they're going to leave and they're going to go get it somewhere else. Well, I do feel like this is part. This should be part of your HR programming. This should be part of your uh, employee or staff investment. This should be part of uh, overall education and training. That's why I personally like to talk about data literacy more or above data storytelling, because data literacy is a little bit more all-encompassing. We can talk about the reading and the writing or analyzing of data, as well as the communicating and consuming of data, uh, which the storytelling part falls in. So when, when you look at it that way, I feel like there is a bigger uh, ROI with data literacy. And with data literacy, you're gonna get the added benefits of data storytelling. It, when you talk about data visualization improvements, people just kind of turn a blind eye. Well, I don't, I don't really care. I'm not a visual person. I, I'm fine with the table of data. When you talk about data storytelling, oh, that sounds great, but whew, that sounds like that's gonna take a lot longer. And uh, we don't have the time to invest in that. When you talk about data literacy with all of the news and the buzz that's out there, oh, well, that could actually impact the bottom line. So you almost get a little bit more buy-in with it. How can organizations self-diagnose whether they have a shortfall in their digital dexterity? Do you have a rubric or a maturity curve that you use to think about data literacy? And how do you choose which groups to work with? How do you pick who to teach how to fish, if you will? There's been a lot of debate over how far and wide do you go at, for a company our size. We have started a, a digital dexterity program, um, and that can be anything from how to turn a computer on or work an iPad all the way up to this type of concept or work. And we instituted that with the top 200 leaders of the enterprise just to kind of guinea pig it out. I have been keeping tabs separately for the last 10 years that I've been here. I know where the challenge spots are. It's almost predominantly on the business side of the house. Humana is going through this very interesting uh, growing experience where we no longer, as IT, serve everyone. A business unit uh, over in Medicaid or Medicare or our clinical folks or our social determinants of health folks or our TRICARE military folks, they have their own embedded development teams now. So IT kind of essentially decentralized and kind of embedded inside of business, um, A, to get work done faster, but B, because they have very unique needs. Therefore, with the decentralization of the teams, the data got decentralized as well. Now everybody has access to data and everybody has the tools. So ultimately what we see is um, who in that situation, what areas in that situation are going off the rails? 
And that's pretty obvious because I can see everything being created in the Microsoft platform area. So I can just open up random dashboards and be like, I'm going to call them. <laughs> but we can also see where the successes are and the wins are. Now, I speak publicly a lot inside of our walls at various conferences and internal events, as well as do these classes. I reach about 20 to 25,000 of our almost 70,000 associates. As a generalized theory, I'm seeing a tremendous improvement in our consistency of how we tell visual stories through our dashboards and digital reports. But there still are a lot of areas that I haven't touched yet. So my prioritization method is one, who comes to me first? Um, I can take on about 70, 80 projects a year, just myself, uh, which is a heck of a lot of work. But when I can't help, I at least reach out to them for consultation and try to get them skilled up quickly with easy wins, low hanging fruit type of stuff, whether that be chart selection or color selection or design layout, or how can I help you tell a better story? Let me give you some ideas. And then they implement. Um, and by doing that, I kind of spread the net. And like I said, I, I'm catching a pretty decent amount of fish, but what I would love to see is a more formalized program where we can measure everyone's starting point. Where are you today? If that's a data literacy scale, great. Uh, where are you today? And then push you through very customized upskilling or reskilling programs that meets your needs very, very quickly so that you become obviously more of an asset to Humana, as well as if you were to ever leave Humana, you can take these skills with you. Awesome. We'd like to conclude with a wrap up we call three, two, one, the three big takeaways from our conversation and what two books or podcasts you would take to a desert island and then your favorite quote you'd like to leave us with. Okay. Uh, three, two, one. Um, every insight that you provide in a reporter dashboard every little micro story or uh, macro story should be meaningful, valuable, and actionable. Those three, those three words, um, they should be meaningful, valuable, and if they are only one or two of those, it doesn't work. It'll fall apart. They have to be everything. And it, you can have the most meaningful and valuable metrics in a dashboard, but if it's not actionable by the leadership team or by the decision makers, it, it fails. Data stories are not just a bunch of data on a page. It's not data vomiting, as I call it. It, it is, it, or beautiful data visualizations. Um, those are components of data storytelling, but don't mistake that as the data storytelling result. A true data story needs that structure. It needs that background. It needs the narrative. It needs the organization. It needs the design thinking. It needs all of the other components that we talked about today. And data storytelling is by far, in my opinion, one of the skills that are that is the most overlooked uh, and needs to be considered as a very highly valuable skill. It shouldn't just be a nice to have when you're searching for people who do BI development, engineering, dashboarding, reporting, even data scientists now, data storytelling should be something that you look for as a skill set. Two books or podcasts. There are so many, so I'm going to limit this to one book and one podcast. Um, out of all of Jordan Morrow's books, uh, The Godfather of Data Literacy, uh, he that he just he just wrote three recently. One of which, though, be data analytical. Really, really great book. His be data literate book is really good. That was his first. But be data analytical encompasses and touches more not just on data literacy, but on the other data mindsets that you have to be in in order for things like data literacy to be successful. Um, and as a podcast, there's. Uh, a group out of Nashville, Tennessee, that has just started doing this podcast called Data for All. It's run by the Belmont Data Collaborative, Belmont University down Nashville, Tennessee, and their director of data science, Charlie Apkin. They cover everything from, you know, in address the data geek stuff 
all the way through big high level theor theoretical concepts like data storytelling or data literacy. Quote, again, so many, it's the purpose of a storyteller is not to tell you how to think, but to give you the questions to think upon. My job as a data storyteller is not to just give you what I think is the best story and for you to read it that way and believe it that way. I'm here to present information so that you can quickly and intuitively consume it, interpret it, analyze it, and make decisions on it. It gets back to that meaningful, valuable, and actionable statement. Awesome, David. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. I appreciate the opportunity. Next, we'll hear from Vivian Richards, a graduate of Correlation One's Data Skills for All Empowerment Program. This segment was recorded in 2021 when Vivian was selected to give an address to her fellow program graduates. Hi, I'm Vivian. I'm a kid from Brooklyn who would eventually move to Texas. I attend the University of Oklahoma and then spend the next 20 years in the United States Army. In the Army, I was an Arabic linguist and a signals intelligence professional. Now I am moving into the next chapter of my life. Applying for the Data Science for All Empowerment was pretty much a no-brainer. I spent 20 years on what I like to call the front line of data evolution, data technology, as the intelligence community continuously hit rapid evolutions to grow and adapt to what was going on. As I was preparing to to retire or to move into the next chapter of my life after the military. I had all of this really tactile experience with data, but lacked a lot of the certifications that would translate my, my data expertise into the um, private sector. I've heard it said that data is the new oil. I think the question is, are we gonna use it to improve uh, society, improve our world, improve our climate, improve our, our collective health and well-being? Are we going to use it to bring equity into places where, where folks are marginalized? Are we going to use it to solve problems like food deserts and um, access to healthcare, access to to resources. That's where I want to be solving problems. The more complex, the more intricate, the more difficult, the better. The best ways of solving problems begins with the removing of bias and, and hubris from how you view the data and how do you, how you, you choose to understand the problem. At the core of my, my personal philosophy is the belief that each and every one of us, because of our uniqueness, because of our difference, brings a fresh and valuable perspective to any problem set. I find strength and diversity. And so I think everyone brings something to data science. There's... Vivian's story is so incredibly compelling. Here are three reasons why. Vivian worked in the front line of data in her 20 year career at the US Army. She brought a unique perspective on the use of data and technology that informed her experience at Correlation One's DS4A program, which is designed to empower and train learners to achieve a high level of data literacy, regardless of their background or experience. Second, despite her 20 years of experience, she lacked access to career opportunities in the private sector. DS4A gave Vivian a proven way to earn certification and access to career opportunities that she sought once she retired from the Army. Finally, Vivian views her unique story and perspective as a core strength. DS4A helps learners like Vivian build foundational data skills and remove barriers to career opportunities by reducing biases in decision-making. So why does Vivian's story matter? She was able to transition from 20 years in the military into working at Splunk by formalizing her data skills and training. She brought a tremendous skill set and unique perspective to DS4A that she's using to understand, communicate, and solve complex problems. Even as enterprise leaders work to improve data storytelling in their organizations, they have to think about the voices in the room, as Vivian says, that shape decisions. We close with a weekly segment we call The Big Number. We heard David Kiomo describe how decisions are impacted by data storytelling at Humana. We also heard from Vivian 
about why unique perspectives are valuable when working on complex problems. So this week, our big number is 400. That's the average number of data sources at enterprise organizations today. How do organizations make sense of such an incredible volume of data in a way that impacts business outcomes? They must enable unique perspectives from stakeholders who are empowered with data storytelling skills and understand how to use that information to make decisions. To do that, we need ubiquitous data literacy. We need data humanized.